This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, welcome to our October virtual roundtable. As we continue to battle through the global pandemic, the security of our financial networks is becoming more critical than ever. As a result, for the next 45 minutes, we have assembled some of the brightest minds in the industry who are going to take us through the current state of network security for global banking and investments, as well as the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. For those of you who are in the group of first 100 registrants for today, please enjoy your lunch, or if you chose, a gift card to a local restaurant. As always though, thank you to all of our viewers for continuing to tune into our roundtables. Just before we begin, as usual, we want to hear from you. So go ahead and type your questions into the chat. Time permitting, we will answer them here. But of course, in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will take the conversation over to LinkedIn. Just search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or simply click on the direct link that we will be sharing in the chat box shortly. Once there, we will cover any of the questions that our panelists don't get a chance to answer within the next 45 minutes. If you would like to register for upcoming virtual roundtables, simply visit jsa.net. Our next one is titled Best Practices for Partnerships in Next-Gen Network Infrastructure, and that will take place on November 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Check it out and register. Now, let's get started. Today's topic, the state of financial networks. To introduce our speakers and moderate, please welcome Charles Desaget, Managing Partner at Cambridge MC. Charles, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'm very happy to moderate uh, this very impressive uh, panel on this such exciting subject today. So part of the panel, we have Gil uh, Santalis, CEO of New Jersey Fiber Exchange. Uh, Mike Persico, uh, CEO of ANOVA Financial Network, and Sujit Panda, CTIO of BDX Data Centers. So before they introduce themselves, I just want to remind the, the subject. So yes, we are talking about the state of financial network. And this is more critical than ever in this specific period of pandemia that we are all experiencing worldwide. That's the first time this is happening. And of course, the transactions are growing exponentially while they are done remotely and hackers are, of course, more tempted. So um, I would like um, your, uh, each of you, Gil, Sujit, and Mike, to introduce yourself, but I will also ask the first question now, if you don't mind, uh, because today uh, uh, you see we are we see in this current state uh, network security is very important, especially for global banking and investments. And we, I would like to have your point of view at what are the challenges on opportunities who lie ahead on this point of view. So maybe, uh, Gail, if you don't mind, if you could start, introduce yourself and maybe answering that question. Sure. So it's Gail Stansley. First of all, Charles, thank you for having me. And JSA, appreciate you putting on this roundtable for us to have a chance to collaborate because we do miss collaborating and having this opportunity is important to kind of exchange ideas. Um, MJFX is the only cable landing station in the US that is carrier neutral with multiple subsea cables and now 26 plus network providers that exchange traffic in North America from, from traffic coming from South America and from Europe. We have four subsea cables. Um, to, to answer your question, it's been a wake-up call for the financial industry uh, seven months ago when their associates went home. And there have been some winners and losers in terms of how they transitioned uh, from this new work-at-home environment. Uh, specifically on the security side, um, it's been a challenge because a lot of them have large data centers. Um, they do have some ad adaptation to the cloud, but Primarily, I would say, for the large multinational financial institutions, they have their own facilities, and now the employees aren't in the buildings that used to connect to those facilities. So they've had to 
reorchestrate their network, and that's provided a whole list of uh, security issues for them in terms of how do they authenticate folks coming into their network. Um, as we know, banks have multiple lines of business. It's not just trading. It's all kinds of financial transactions, and it's really the trust business they're in. So security is paramount. Their customers have to trust them, and the transactions that they do are important because they're trusted transactions. So I, I think I'm curious to hear from the rest of our panelists as well in terms of how they see this unfolding, but the number one priority banks have is to be trusted in a secure transaction environment. Thank you very much, Gil. Um, Mike, would you like to introduce yourself or also continue on that question? Sure. Mike Persico, founder and CEO of Anova Financial Networks. And for those of you that don't know, we're an international carrier explicitly uh, for the electronic trading community. So our MO is to connect the world's liquidity centers. And if they're already connected, then to optimize those connections. We do that through fiber medium and also wirelessly. And so, you know, we have a big footprint in, in not only the US, but also expanding over into Asia. And so a lot of our customers are, are data center centric, you know, but I certainly can touch on um, what it means to work and trade from home. And, you know, it's, it, it, I'll share an interesting story, but I first want to talk about really what we saw right after the pandemic hit, which was people rushed to increase their internet connectivity because they were going to um, VPN people in from home and the backbone circuits just weren't enough to take uh, in all of these. If you think about how many people work at a uh, Morgan Stanley or JPM or someone like that, that's a lot of people coming into the home office to hit their trading screens that are then connected to uh, the exchange data centers. And, and so it, it was a capacity issue before it was a security issue. And then the security became sort of, a, a, I think, some of the more industry accepted VPN, which, to be honest with you, is fallible. You know, the types of home security that have been prevalent never took into account, you know, the increased requirements of trading. They certainly had that in their home office or in their, their main office, but people didn't have it in their home office. And so what we found after that, when it became apparent that not only was it kind of somewhat insecure, but it might not even meet regulatory standards, we saw a move to people install point-to-point -point circuits to their homes. So to get off yeah. the public mm -hmm. internet and go on to private dedicated circuits, and, you know, what we, the, the, the humorous part of this was Long Island is where a lot of the New York uh, traders went. Um, they had homes up there. For those of you that don't know, it's two and a half hours east on a good day um, by car. And so um, they, the, we saw an uptick in point-to-point -point circuits from Manhattan, from their desks where they used to sit, to now their Long Island home. So one gig dedicated <laughs> fiber circuit so they didn't have to uh, be on the internet. And so that's kind of a, a, a sign of the times. And it remains to be seen how many of those traders go back into the office and, and, and how, for how many people this is what it's gonna look like in perpetuity. Thank you very much, Mike, that's very interesting. <laughs> Um, Sujit, you are, you are in India, I believe, in Mumbai. Can you yeah, yeah, Mumbai currently, um, sure. yeah. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thanks to you sure. and the JSA team for putting up this round table. Um, I'm Sujit Panda. I'm the CTIO of BDX. Uh, BDX is a pan-Asian data center platform, um, which we've kind of recently it's not a startup from if you look at the EBITDA that we have currently, but yes, the entire team is a brand new team. We've come together to create a new kind of data center platform, right? And kind of challenging the incumbents in, in most of the markets that we operate in. It's an interesting region to be operating in. We operate in China. We operate, uh, we've got massive facilities in China. We've got uh, two very large uh, facilities in Hong Kong. We have a facility in Singapore. So 
you know, when, when the pandemic actually stuck, we kind of right in the middle of it, right? So it's a kind of a perfect storm for us. So <clears throat> the good part, uh, I'll talk about the good part and the bad part both. So the good part was, uh, you know, um, before, before we started BDX, because BDX is basically uh, grown inorganically, right? So the first thing that we had done when we created the platform is what's the kind of, you know, unique thing that we're trying to do in the data center industry. And what we decided is that we would want to have minimally manned data centers, right? Trying to look at how do we automate some of the functions that a data center does, right? So as part of that, uh, you know, MO, the entire focus was trying to get, uh, you know, have a central kind of a, uh, knock, so as to speak, which kind of is the is the humming center wherein all the platforms are being managed from, right? So that's that's the good part. The bad part is, uh, yeah, the the humming center, so as to say, you centralize a lot of functions. That's also going to be hit by the pandemic, right? So, <clears throat> so how do you actually look at you know some of the things that we tried to do? How do you keep most of the critical facilities running without any downtime, right? Uh, how do you help customers? Because you know, when you're a very large data center with some of the largest banks in the world operating out of your facilities, how do you support them when they can't get their people in there, right? And they are seeing a massive surge in uh, requirements, massive surge in compute, massive surge in bandwidths. How do you do that, right? You can't get their people there, and your people uh, are are not able to travel back into the facility. So how do you do it? And that's where the digital investments have paid off uh, in, in some parts. And, and we did a lot of learnings in terms of what we need to do. And, and the good thing is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we operate on a Jan to December kind of financial year. We do our, we started the AOP thing here. And this is the first time that my CEO walks in and says, hey, you know, you need to ramp up your digital investments, right? Every year, <laughs> here, you know, I, I, I used to be asked questions like, you need to justify every dollar that you're spending, right? And, Show you that. Okay. <laughs> and here he comes, walks in and says, you know, tell me, how are you actually getting everything digital? So there's no question of an ROI anymore. The pandemic has proved that ROI. That's the, that's the good part. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike, Sujit, and, and Gil, for your introductions on the, the question answer. I'd like to go to another question uh, related to your customers, and of course, related to the subject. Uh, is what do, you, do your customers today, in this context, the financial world, want more than anything else? And maybe related to that one, what do you wish your customers knew? So, I don't know, maybe I start with Gil again? Sure, so, so I, I wish my customers really understood how our industry works. There's only very few financial customers that take the time to understand how their routes work from their facilities to their destinations. But for example, there's cables that cross the Mediterranean and there's single points of failures, for example, in the Suez Canal, but there is an option that if they took the time to understand, they could work with a company called Sparkle, a new cable called Blue Med, and that allows them to bypass that one pinch point. The day that that problem happens, there'll be very few banks that will transact in a normal fashion. And the ones that didn't pay attention will have some issues. There's lots of issues like this across the US, uh, along the I-95 corridor, people aren't familiar, but most of the traffic that goes from New York down to Ashburn finds itself going over the same exact bridge. And there's only very few financials that have taken the time to look at alternate paths. There's a new cable being developed, for example, that's going to go from our building in New Jersey down to Virginia, Myrtle Beach to Florida. It's going to be along the coast. And there's two banks that are currently going to be on that system. I can't imagine the banks that don't go on that system the day that you have a, have a problem going down I-95. So I, I guess what banks I wish they knew was, I wish they took the time to understand our industry and not just buy from a brochure, buy from a salesperson presenting lots of products and services, but to take the time to know their routes and know how it actually works so they can ensure their reliability will always be there. Super, thanks for very interesting, Gil. Uh, Mike, 
On the same question? You know, what do my clients want more than anything? Volume and volatility. And, and so, <laughs> okay. you know, it's, uh, it's been interesting because for the first six months, they had both of those in spades. And there was, you know, this was the, the first half of the year was the best trading year in the past 10, and probably since 08. Mm -hmm. And so now things have cooled down uh, since then, since uh, mid-year. And, you know, we, we're, we're seeing a lot of people kind of uh, waiting with bated breath um, until the election, which we do expect to be some of the heaviest traded volume um, in, in recent years as well. So, um, you know, for by all accounts, you know, it's that this this has been you know a better year on on those uh, from those aspects from a volume and volatility aspect but you know what i wish they knew is that you know it's it's difficult to be an infrastructure provider you know we compete at the nanosecond level you know that's how uh decisions are being made and you know so G, you talk about return on investment and it's easy uh, to justify returns in my business if you're getting uh, milliseconds, you know, for this improvement. But how do you justify the last nanosecond? And frankly, what's the value of it? And, sure. and so, you know, you, Gil, you talk about buying off a brochure or, you know, in our world, it's buying off uh, numbers, you know, and numbers that are, you know, two or three decimal point after the decimal point, Right. And so, you know, that takes you know, CapEx investment, that takes constant redesign and deployment of new technologies. And it's not a, a snap of the fingers. There's a ton of R&D that go into this. Now, having said this, uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm crying into my milk because we love what we do. It's exciting. It's challenging. We're on the bleeding edge, you know. Maybe a pat on the back every once in a while might be nice, you know. <laughs> so, um, but uh, that's that's my answer. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Sujit, your answer. I'm looking. We are looking all for your answer. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, what I think, uh, you know, when we look at security, uh, but what I want my customers to understand is, you know, typically I've seen customers being very focused on one thing: cybersecurity, right? How do I stop an attack from happening? <clears throat> and, and one of the things that I keep saying is, guys, whatever your focus is, right? If it is going to happen, it will happen, right? So <clears throat> instead of focusing on one piece of the continuum, which is, you know, the perimeter, right? Which is, you know, how to stop an attack, start looking at what do you do when you are under an attack and what do you do after an attack, right? Start looking at all the three pieces. And when you look at the plan in terms of when you, Try to create a cyber plan, uh, a cybersecurity plan. Don't just look at how do I prevent an attack from happening, because you know I've seen attack surfaces changing uh, so so much. Right, technology has broadened, and, and especially the pandemic. And, and I, I think everybody would agree when we when we put everybody at home. Uh, and I think Gil spoke about it when we when we put uh, Wi-Fi, um, you know, running from the home. Uh, you know, I, I think Mike spoke about the fact that, you know, people want to get off the internet and, and they start to look at point-to-point uh, -point links. All of this was focused on a couple of things. It's, it's trying to be make things less latency sensitive. It's trying to look at getting off the internet, right? So security was one of the concerns. Latency was this other concern, right? But what do you do when you are under attack, irrespective of whether what you are doing? Because you're, you're, when you look at the work from home scenario, the entire thing, the entire perspective has changed. So I call this a cyber resiliency instead of cyber security, right? And and uh, the way we have worked with our customers is that we we looked at uh, we had a product which which was BDX Armor, right? So and I I when I went to talk to my financial customers, typically would and we have got some of the among the top five banks with two of the largest banks in the globe sitting inside of data centers. And when I talk to them, they say, hey, guys, you know what? You don't don't talk about these. We've got the best security professionals, right? And nothing can enter our network. And I've, I'm not supposed to be speaking about it, but I've seen some of these best protected networks getting, you know, impacted, right? And one of the things that I keep
keep talking to on a peer level is it is going to get impact you you're going to get impacted better start looking at when you are under attack what will you do so cyber resiliency is something that i keep kind of pushing my customers to understand a little bit more instead of just preventing attacks yeah and it's a big subject because this is uh, growing by we this is part of the subject in the finance industry especially you're going really fast why because there's something to do there's money to get out of it and if you're not protected against that it's a big uh, it's crazy and the experience i have in this base from europe you know i would say that that the large companies the large organizations maybe are protected um, okay but the small and medium ones no they are not protected and if they get attacked uh, even the financial small ones they lose everything they lose their business and they can close their business and that's uh, that's absolutely key okay thank you very much um my next question is i think i will combine two questions actually it is what is the most exciting development change you see right now for the past let's say six months or this year and also what is the most adventurous thing you or your company have done during this time so maybe uh back to the why we are why we are together maybe you want to start with this one yeah kind of um it was a complete paradigm change for us um in terms of you know the most adventurous thing if you want well, that's a, that's a very exciting question uh you know we kind of uh we kind of gave uh, gave out a notification to all of our employees saying that um you know work from home is permanent now you decide where you want to work from right and and uh, this is this is not just because um you know we felt it is in fashion but the first thing that we realized is that because we have a centralized knock uh, a centralized way of putting all our management infrastructure at one single place and when the pandemic hit the the engineers have to operate out of home right uh, so what do you do right so uh, you know we took a decision that we will ensure that we set up a practice which is knock with all the engineers operating from the residence right so mm-hmm. we shipped out uh, you know pre built kits right saying that this is the kit that goes out this is how you connect to us this is how you ensure security and and by doing that we ensure that we provided an office like environment at the residence so okay. you know once and we're still under lockdown by the way right I, i'm in india the the uh, the uh, this the the uh, dr is is going to be in singapore the the primary site is in india and that to mumbai and mumbai is under lockdowns people are operating from homes so the thing was when we took that decision you know a lot of people questioned us we trying to say that you you your an essential service is being operated out of people's residences what about the security we said we talk to this right and touch with mm-hmm. this has gone very well and not just with respect to um uh you know the technology piece but with respect to the psychological aspect of it you know one of the big things that i have learned personally when we look at work from home is that it's not just about the technology it's also about the psychological impact from for work from home people right so mm-hmm. we took care of both of this in in a in a bunch of innovative ways and that's the an adventurous thing that we've done okay thank you very much um mike do you want to to answer those questions do you shall i do i do got them or you sure. shall so um yeah the first part was what was the most interesting thing in the last 6 months and the second part was Alors, the first part was the most exciting, even exciting, more exciting, interesting. Yes. Much, you see? Yeah. And then the second one, what was the most adventurous thing you or your company have done during this time? So what you see, what you've done, exciting, both. Yeah, you know, it was for us, or for me personally, we always felt, you know, this is our, uh, my, myself and the management team, this is our third company that we've uh, uh, been a part of that we've built from the ground up. And our mentality was a little old school. We believed that everybody need to be, needed to be in a central location. That was how you established morale and generated a culture and had a confluence of expertise, mm. you know, mm. and this was very traditional. We weren't, we weren't alone in espousing mm. this perspective. And, and our big concern, 
um, was what happens when you take that away? Um, you know, do people still feel um, like they're part of something? You know, uh, will the morale main high, uh, remain high? What is your culture then and uh, as an organization if you're all disassociated? And then, of course, what happens to productivity? Can people still be as pro- uh, productive if they're working from home in their PJs? You know, and what we found was is that we were pleasantly surprised. You know, we had serious reservations about doing this. There was challenges. How do you get accounting set up to work remotely when they're inherently kind of a, a very cloistered organization? So you have to put, you know, very sensitive uh, uh, files up, you know, uh, in, a, in an external fashion so people have access to them. But besides that, you know, it was more about culture, morale, and productivity. And what we found is that people uh, responded very well. And, you know, there are some folks that we don't think will will come back and we're more amenable to letting them do that, you know, as, as a going concern than we ever were. Now you have the flip side of someone who's younger, they, have, they live in an apartment, they, they have roommates, and so they work in their bedroom, they sleep in their bedroom, they, they go eat their meals in their bedroom, and they live in a, in a hundred square feet. So, you know, they were dying for me to reopen the office. And so yeah. we ended up being 50-50, you know, in terms of people who come back and who, who happened. But, you know, my takeaway with all of this is that ultimately our productivity stayed high. You find different ways to connect to keep your morale and culture up. And the question is, is can you, how long can that continue? I recall Anderson Consulting went to an all remote model and it lasted for, yeah. it was great until about year two. And then people became very disaffected and disillusioned and went back to a more traditional uh, environment. That's what they were looking for. And so is, is this, you know, a different scenario, a different situation? Perhaps, but long term, I question if, if it can remain this way. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and that's a good question because, because um, this is happening, as we say, this is happening everywhere for every company, every sector, globally, worldwide. The issue is what's going to be the next step? Because, okay, it works. As you say, productivity works. We can work remotely. We can work from home. We can work from everywhere. At the same time, this is not replacing the real interactivity between people. Look what we are doing right now. Okay, we are doing this exercise. It's great. It works. But, of course, we would prefer to be in the same room. We would prefer to do that. So it's, it's a little different. So it's a question of, so again, isolation. And we speak about that also, I think, in many countries. But anyway, um, Gil, I would like to have your point of view on this, on this question. We at NJFX started an initiative before COVID started about getting young people involved in our industry. We started at PTC with Millennials and Telcom and Felix Sade on our team did a great job in having that first session. Once COVID started, there was a concern that we would stop. And I'm proud to say that our team never stopped. You know, we've got Felix Seda, Sarah Kurtz. They've been actively involved with groups such as Suboptic, working with JSA and doing programs for high schools locally. A lot of folks have looked for leadership during this time. And what my team was able to do is continue on an effort to inspire young people to look at our industry because now it's imperative that we have the next generation ready to go. So we've got a whole pipeline of young folks that we're trying to attract to come into the industry. We went as far as even hiring an intern this summer that we never met. The intern worked for us from Washington, D.C., never came to the office. Um, She did a phenomenal job for us. In terms of exciting things, the, the most exciting thing that I've seen that we're a part of is we've gotten the cable companies, the residential IP providers, to start coordinating an NJFX and offer their access networks to multinational banks, to universities, to hospitals. The whole issue of the internet is that I don't know where it goes. I don't, it's a best effort network. But if you can eliminate hops by having the residential IP providers interconnect with your customers, you all of a sudden have private networks. So I'm happy to say Verizon announced that they're being a customer and a pop at NGFX, a huge provider in the U.S. in terms of residential IP, not only on home services, but on cell phone services as well. 
Altice is here, Comcast is on its way. So we have a massive amount of residential IP and we've got IX providers, such as DKICS, that are coordinating the ISPs so that the enterprise and financials can have better connectivity to their associates that are now at home. Thank you. Congratulations for Verizon. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's great. Okay, so um, my next question actually is uh, what challenges on opportunities lie ahead, particularly, of course, during these uncertain times, on which challenges are you most excited uh, to face? And actually, Gil, if you could go start with that. You know, I, I think everyone realizes diversity, network diversity is paramount. And we now have, in the financial markets, everyone paying attention. We spend a lot of time with the banks explaining who the carriers are. The biggest challenge is that they don't have MSAs. So we'll have a large multinational bank move in. They only know how to work with four providers. We've got to find smaller companies that are nimble enough that have MSAs in place and can take these unique solutions, put them on their paperwork, and allow these banks to take advantage of the best network architecture possible. I think that's going to be important going forward. That's what these banks need to see. We need to provide better solutions, better transparency in how these networks really operate but with the find a way for these large multinational banks to be able to execute their agreements. And, and we're working with companies, such as Inova, for example, to kind of see if that makes sense. If they have those relationships, they have those MSAs, could they perhaps work with our strategic network providers, pull together a solution and, and satisfy the bank's requirements? We're going to do a lot more of that. And um, I think that's the next chapter. They need to know how things work. It can't be you know, get online, I can't give you an answer today. They need clarity on their networks. Okay, thank you very much, Gil. Mike, if you could answer that question as well, what's your point of view? Uh, Mike, you're on mute, can see. Funny story about bank MSAs, <laughs> you know, when we first started doing this uh, 11 years ago, we were, we were in front of, a, you know, Avenue of America's uh, bank and, and, and I said, how long to do an MSA? And he said, well, you know, how long to give birth? And I said, oh, you know, labor lasts 24, <laughs> 36 hours if, if, it's, if it's a bad one, right? You know, and but they meant nine months, right? And, and so, and it, and it took 14, right? So, you know, that's a very real thing. And, you know, sometimes we, what we see is you may have to partner if you want to provide services to a large multinational corporation and you don't have an MSA, the quickest way to revenue, the quickest way to provide that solution is to partner with someone who does, you know, because the doors aren't open to do new ones. Nobody wants to spend those cycles. And by nobody, I mean them. And so, you know, it's uh, that, 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 that's a real challenge. And so I know what you're saying, Gil, in terms of trying to present these diversity options when you know the number of people you can go to are somewhat limited, but you know, in, in regards to challenges, you know, what we see is, you know, um, we have three legs of the stool, or you know, three arms of the triangle, and it's latency, availability, and capacity. And now, you know, there's been a fourth one introduced, which is security. And so the, the challenge here is how do you satisfy four masters? And, you know, to us, it's, you, it's difficult to focus on all of them at once. You almost have to force rank them. But the second that you do that and you decide that one is more important than the others, then you have a contingent of uh, clients that are disaffected with that choice. If you say latency is the most important, other people may say capacity, I need capacity. Or if you focus on availability, other people may say, but yes, you know, the, the whole topic of this panel is security. We need that because my traders are never coming back to work. So what are you doing to focus on that as a company? And so three masters was difficult, four is, is a challenge, right? 
And, you know, it's about being smart with your, your investment and your R&D dollars and spreading it uh, 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 across all of those aspects to make sure that you're progressing your products across all of those lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And I will come back to you uh, on the partnership side on the next question. <laughs> but I want to have the, the point of view of Sujit. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, Mike, uh, about a very important thing, you know, the number of legs on a stool is increasing, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, way, the way I look at this is that, uh, you know, when, when we look at any problem, right, what is that we want to focus on? So, uh, and, and that's the significant change that we look at. We look at any situation that is going to happen and we look at, do we react to the situation or do we react to the people? So we look at, we react to our customers. So. Uh, when we look at that aspect, you know, what's not going to change? I, I, you know, the pandemic happened. Every, everybody asked me, what's changed? I would say, what's not changing? So, uh, Mike mm -hmm. gave both the points point out, right? Is the diversity in network going to change? Is the customer's requirement for diversity in the network? Like, you know, the customer saying that I want all, I want you to give me all the four things that, that this tool is made of or five things or six things as we go forward. So what is that we focus on? We focus on the things that are not going to change. Network resiliency, right? Security, right? And infrastructure resiliency. When I look at a data center, what do you want? Infrastructure resiliency in terms of the facility and power, uh, you need good security, whether it is it's the physical security, whether the perimeter security, the way the car comes inside the building, you need good security. And the third piece is connectivity. So from a connectivity standpoint, I think uh, what the first thing that we looked at is, you know, our customers can now connect to networks through uh, software, right? Uh, we, we front end the MSA. It's a trust based relationship that we've set up. For example, in Hong Kong, we've got the carriers inside and say, hey, guys, we're going to be standing, you know, any contract that you're entering is with us. Don't worry about it. We will stand in, in capacity. If it increases, decreases, don't worry about it. I've got a customer. And if he needs more capacity, you don't worry about the billing challenges. We will take care of it. We will stand guard for that. So uh, security, you know, we, we looked at how do we provide right from the physical security to the IT security to actually sitting with our customers and trying to consult with them in terms of what we can do for them, right? So, so that's been the challenging piece, the trying to get our customers to understand our viewpoint in terms of what we think is right, right? And they might not agree, right? So trying mm -hmm. to get into consultative mode with them and trying to help them understand our point of view has been the most challenging thing. The good part about is where there is a challenge, there is an opportunity. We've been Security, uh, you know, if I look at uh, numbers, right, we've seen the sales numbers increasing, going through the roof from the security side, right? People have asked for, you know, um, connectivity solutions. People have asked for, yeah. you know, using shared VPN services. People have asked for endpoint security because they want to be kind of connecting to their assets all, all over the internet. Um, we have an SD-WAN gateway. People, it's, it's kind of, we have, we have increased our SD-WAN gateway uh, sizing three three x times from from March till uh, the last upgrade happened last month. Three x times the SD-WAN gateway size. So we've seen everything increasing because there was a mm. challenge. We responded well, so we making. Uh, I I shouldn't use the word because it looks a little. Uh, you know, uh, the, these are not the best of times. We made money out of it, but yes, because mm. we responded okay. to the challenge. Okay, super, super excited. I'm just conscious of time. I'm just telling you we, we have six minutes left. We have three more questions that could be okay. So, uh, Mike, <laughs> we were talking about partnership. Um, well, my question, quite open question, see, whose partnering style do you admire? And who's comp well, whose partnering style do you admire? Actually, that's my question. <coughs> if, you, if you can hear me. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I, I, I can hear you. Whose partnering style do I admire? Um, you know, Tough question, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's partnerships are usually they're they're meant to be two way streets, but good ones are hard to find. They usually end up being quite unilateral. 
And, and so sometimes we say, when someone says we want a partner, we, we say, so, you know, um, you want us to give you a lot and we get little in return. You know, so <laughs> my point is, is that there's, there's a, they're, they're difficult to find, um, you know, and so uh, off the top of my head, you know, we do see some of the really big carriers, though, um, being more and more willing to um, use, offer their products in conjunction with our niche offerings. I'll give you an example. Uh, you take a transatlantic provider who uh, takes their capacity and then they use our wireless on either end, right? In the United mm-hmm. States and in you know Europe. And so some of the people that are offering those type of services, we're seeing them be more flexible than, than ever. And the reason is, is because you know, they, can, they don't offer our, our niche services and we don't have a cable under the, under the sea. Right. So it's a bit of a forced marriage, but, you know, at at least they're becoming they're getting to the point where they understand that they can't be the end to end underlying carrier. And and we appreciate that flexibility. um, And we think that that's a a, a good thing for the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Gil, the point of view on this? Yeah, Mike's right. It's all about the structure of the deal. If you have a relationship where your parties or complimentary, it's going to work. So in our case, we make it, make it as a business, we do not compete with our customers. So right off the bat, we're in great shape. We want our customers to be successful. We're carrier neutral. Our job is to get the best carriers we can to offer the best solutions possible and make sure they all know each other. We consider ourselves a Tinder of telecom. We're trying to make sure that everyone knows who's <laughs> and able to execute. And at the same time too, to to provide our community assistance, we make sure that we believe what the carriers are saying they're good at doing. And we try to help flesh that out. So our role is really just to be that that platform where they can meet, be able to execute their relationship and then get out of their way, let them do what they do best. Okay, thank you. Um, Sujit? Very quickly, please, because then I have one last question, and I think we will be running out of time. So what's your point of view on this, on, on partnering style? I think um, it's important for, for a data center operator to understand that you know, the cloud providers are not competing with you. They're complementary, right? Um, uh, uh, most of our customers have uh, part of their assets in our data centers and a part of their assets on the cloud side. So, <clears throat> so we will have to look at ways and means of ensuring that this hybrid ecosystem, you know, is is available to them all the time. So if there if there is uh, some elasticity that we need in terms of uh, uh, requirement, how do we take that elasticity without any disruption to the Amazon cloud, right? For example, right. So uh, I kind of uh, like uh, the partnership style. If if you if I may, Amazon is is a great company, right? So one of the things that I like about them mm-hmm. is the customer focus we want to do is emulate the kind of you know uh, the kind of customer sensitivity that they bring to the table so uh, so that's been um, something that we have focused on majorly how do we help our customers uh, elastic you know elastically get to the cloud right and and that could be multiple of clouds the multi cloud environment is is there to stay right so that's been our uh, focus area okay thank you so i have guys one last question for you um Actually, it was two, but I which combine in one. And so how do you keep focus in this uncertain world? But actually, maybe related, what keeps you awake? So maybe you want to start a subject. What keeps you awake today, tonight, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, you know, security, obviously. If you want to get, uh, professionally speaking, uh, security is, is one of the key things. You know, you know, I keep telling uh, when, we, when we talk to our peers, when we talk to our colleagues, the biggest thing that keeps me awake is what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? I don't know. Uh, I've seen so many uh, things in such a short period of time that, you know, I keep fretting about things that people think is, is so natural, whether it's the physical access card, uh, whether it is the, the facial recognition that we get in when we get walk into a data hall. I kind of think that everything is going to be uh, an alien invasion, right? Uh, so that keeps me awake. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mike, 
What keeps you awake in this uncertain world? Uh, Charles, I think Mike. we lost Mike. So why don't we hear from Gil? Yeah. Sure. Ah, we lost Mike. Okay, but Gil, what keeps you awake? You can tell maybe about Mike. What keeps him awake? I don't know. <laughs> I think so. We, Mike, and I are all in the similar business. We're in a critical asset business, critical infrastructure, and we've had to have our employees continue to work throughout this pandemic and take guards to try and help them be able to be safely here at the offices and, and coordinate their duties. But this pandemic taking a turn for the worse could be catastrophic. At the end of the day, it's about people that have to make the machines work and have the equipment run. And if we had a, a wider scale pandemic where this truly became a problem, call it next year, my biggest fear is that we would lose staff. And the staff we have are highly trained they're very specific and we need to keep them safe and make sure we have resources for them. So yes, it's the people. These people are very important to our business. They're the ones that are working while the rest of us are all at home. Okay. Okay. So I, I think, yes, we lost Mike, unfortunately, connection. Um, I want to thank you to the three of you, <laughs> not only to the of you for very interesting and great uh, debate. And I hope uh, the, the participants who are connected found it also very interesting. And um, I look forward to for our next one <laughs> in the future. Ah, Mike is back. Sorry, Mike yeah. is back. Mike, Mike uh, if, you can, if you allow me, if you allow me one minute, you will allow me one minute. Go ahead. Yes. Mike, I wanted to ask you what, are you still here? Are you here? Yep, I'm here. Mike, I wanted to ask you what keeps you awake, and at that time you left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not having connections to Zoom calls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's 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 really it, it. What we focus on a lot is where to expand, you know, and because everything we do is 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 really capex intensive, and so ultimately, you know. The days of people um, signing pre-construction contracts to participate in a network, say uh, even a, a very large network from Chicago to um, the West Coast, you know, the Pacific West Coast. So those people don't do that anymore. So when you make a decision to build, it is very much field of dreams. You have to hope they come. Now you do your diligence and you you survey the market and you understand the trends, but you do so very much at your own risk. And if market uh, events mm. or regulatory landscape changes, you know, you could be left with an asset that's difficult to get a return on. And that, so I think that's happening right now with China it, when you're gauging whether or not to do investments there. And so we think about this all the time if, you know, and when we're, we're looking at expansion is how, what is our return going to be and how certain it, 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 is it? And the answer is it's pretty uncertain. Okay. Okay. Well, now I can say thank you a second time because <laughs> you were come back, Mike. Thank you to you, Mike, to you, Gil, and to you, uh, Sujit, for attending this uh, very exciting panel and discussion. And uh, Carl, I think it's up to you for the conclusion. If you're yeah, you're there, Carl. Yes, thank you to all for your expert opinions on the state of today's financial networks. Um, I learned quite a lot from watching today's panel and I hope our viewers did as well. Um, I also want to shout out, obviously, our guest moderator for today, Charles Desaget. Thank you so much. Uh, Charles is the managing partner at Cambridge MC and he did an excellent job in keeping us on point today. Uh, just a quick reminder, we're now going to shift our conversation over to LinkedIn, where we will be able to answer any more of your questions. Just click on the direct link that was shared in the chat box earlier uh, to continue on to the Q&A. And to go ahead and register for future upcoming JSA roundtables, simply visit jsa.net. Our next one on November 12th will examine best practices in partnerships for next generation network infrastructure.
Well, that's a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right.